Hey there, BookTube. Noah. Everyone who reads It Must Converse is the channel. Thanks for coming back by. Today I'm going to do uh, something I think is very, very interesting and will be interesting to what you, whether you like, uh, whether you read Buddhist sutras or not. I'm going to work into or explore Buddhist sutra uh, in context of setting. So there's a lot to be said about it and it'll be very fun. Um, I'm going to focus at the end of the video a little bit on the Avatamsaka Sutra. Here's the dust jacket. This is the actual book. Um, it is a huge, amazing work that has, was recently acquired by me. Thank you, baby. My wife, Emily, uh, got it for me for Father's Day. So this is something that I've read before and read this translation before, but was kind of uh, printing it off. I had it digital and printing it off and just reading it and uh, it's cumbersome, right? So this is this is just amazing to have. It's a very mind-blowing text, but we'll save that for the end of the video once we get there, right? Because that's going to be the last uh, the last one that we talk about. So I hope you enjoy this. Exploring uh, Buddhist sutras in terms of setting is very very interesting because we have uh, the first group of sutras, Pali Canon. Tripitaka. So this is where the Dhammapada is there. All the, you know, the very traditional uh, sutras that are words that the Buddha actually uttered. Those sutras are the Pali Canon. And these sutras um, are all about practice, individual practice. Most of the time, the Buddha is speaking with a group of monks, a group of practitioners whether they be neophytes or you know a very you know very uh maybe a high level practitioner relatively speaking right uh it's it doesn't work to compare very very often uh, sometimes it does right so all of the pali canon sutras they're going the setting is going to be in india uh very mundane these monks may have just gone and got their alms for the day, got their one meal a day. They go around and, 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 and beg, beg, beg alms, and get a, get a bowl, return to their park or grove or wherever they're, they're at, that they're uh, staying at the time, and then they have a talk after their meal, right? Uh, sometimes the setting is on top of a mountain. Sometimes, the, you know, as they're walking around, and certain aspects of the setting will be used by the Buddha very masterfully in a in a talk. Um, I remember uh, certain certain times where the Buddha is on Vulture Peak, uh, which will come up again. So there's a there's a sutras in the Pali Canon where he's on Vulture Peak, things like that. But long story short, the all of the sutras in in the Pali Canon in the first iteration of Buddhism there like that are going to be very mundane. It's going to be your day-to-day -day, um, world, nothing nothing wild. It, I, it does suffice to say that we're talking about spiritual text, so there's going to be spiritual energy and spiritual beings that are expounded on, even in the very first of these, but they are all rooted firmly within the Hindu uh, cosmology. Buddhism is something that grew out of Hinduism and, early, or, and Brahmanism, right? Early Hinduism. And this cosmology is something that is part of uh, Buddhism as well. Maybe augments it, maybe reframes it as, as to what our purpose is here, things like that, but the cosmology being a cyclic existence and uh, the levels of uh, the Godhead, uh, heavenly realms, and also hell realms, and the animals where they fit in, and these kind of things, all that is, uh, is the same as, as Hinduism, or Brahmanism at that time, right? So the Pali Canon was all that we had for, you know, maybe five, 500 to a thousand years after the Buddha uh, started having, giving his teachings, right? And then there was a great writing down of scriptures and Buddhism was, and, and, you know, is still, you know, and was moving through culture after culture after culture. And certain sutras at that time, you know, 500 to 1,000 years after the Pali Canon, certain sutras uh, became 
uh, just uh, immensely popular because of their because of their power. One of those is the diamond that cuts through illusion. This is Prajna Paramita. That is a perfection of wisdom sutra. So uh, when when there's a a, a a title of a of a Buddhist sutra that is is concerned with one of the perfections, which is a virtue, an inexhaustible virtue that the Bud the bodhisattvas practice enlightening beings. That uh, that book is going to or that sutra is going to be um, very high 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 minded. It's going to be for uh, you know basically blowing apart any kind of mundane ideas or relative ideas, conditioned ideas, and opening you up for something unconditioned, something completely um you know out, out of the box is is a is a very light way of putting it the setting of the diamond sutra is something that's kind of an in betweener between the pali canon these these scriptures that are all very you know in the real world we would say and in the diamond sutra we start off in the very very much the same way they they have alms sabuti which is a, one of the disciples of the buddha comes up to him and gives him this question. World honored one, if the sons and daughters of good families want to give rise to the highest, most fulfilled and awakened mind, what should they rely on and where should they uh what what should they do to master their thinking? So a very straightforward uh question, right? If if you really want to um give rise to the highest, most fulfilled awakened mind what do you focus on? How do you master your thinking? And in the middle, I mean, you know, this is just the very start. That's the first uh, paragraph. That's the question that's put to the Buddha. And then the Buddha says, replies with what is called the first flash of lightning. This is how the Buddha, Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas, uh, enlightening beings, great beings, master their thinking. How many species of living beings there are, whether born from eggs, from the womb, from moisture, or spontaneously, whether they have form or do not have form, whether they have perceptions or do not have perceptions, and whether it can be said of them that they have perceptions or that they do not have perceptions, we must lead all of these beings to the ultimate nirvana so that they can be liberated. And when this innumerable, immeasurable, infinite number of beings has become liberated, we do not in truth think that a single being has become liberated. Why is this so? If Sabuti, a bodhisattva, an enlightening being, holds on to the idea that a self, a person, a living being, or a lifespan exists, that person is not an authentic bodhisattva. So, uh, you know, wow, right? Like, you know, we, we, he's asking for practical um, instruction on practice and what he gets is this um, answer that is pushing to destroy dualities destroy any kind of sense of self and other and there being a line between that um, with a being being a, in a cyclic existence lifetime after lifetime um, tied by karma to so many things in your experience um, the perspective of practice is a lot greater than what uh, what is going on just you know what can i do in this lifetime what can i do right now to be a better person and to gain an enlightened state of mind now uh, that the perspective is elevated to a very high level something that i call an absolute perspective because we're taking um some of the uh, power out of these ego ideas, this dual, 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 dual ideas of self and other and uh, life and death and these kind of things that um, ultimately, from a spiritual perspective, need to be shed in order to have a perspective of what am I doing and, and what's the most effective way to do it, right? So a kind of in-betweener there, between the mundane, we got an absolute and then something like the Lotus Sutra. Um, you can see a video de dedicated to the Diamond Sutra on my channel. I'll link it in the description box. And a series of videos, maybe three, 
on my channel going through the Lotus Sutra here because they are very, very mind-blowing and awesome works. If you're interested, check out those links. In the Lotus Sutra, we have a setting that is also in the real world. We're on Vulture Peak, and the Buddha is there with a, a huge group, maybe 5,000, maybe 15,000, something crazy, a group of monks and nuns and lay practitioners. So a lot of people just around watching, uh, there to meditate with the Buddha, be there, listen to whatever needs to, is going to be said, all that. There is simple meditation and then, but the setting, not, not just of the mundane people, but then we see, uh, very quickly at the start that bodhisattvas are all around, heavenly beings are all around, demonic entities are all around, um, just, just, there's all kinds of beings, even from other world systems. And it's, it's, it's a huge setting. And you start to realize that we're right in the middle. You know, being on the vulture peak on the top of this mountain is right in the middle, you know, the boundary between the, the relative and the absolute. So it starts off on that line, um... Uh, of this, of something like the Dhamma Sutra. This book then, uh, you know, proceeds to destroy ideas of time and eternity, where, you know, they're, they're, you're just in the eternal realm, and then we see enlightenment energy as a process that is working itself out and going to work out, and that's just how it is. The enlightenment energy as process. But in that, um, this setting of this becomes something even more. Uh, it is fully absolute and universal. The relative is encompassed within, whereas in the Diamond Sutra, it might be, you know, they're, they're in the relative and they're, they're, they're reaching for the absolute and it's just a, a series of sledgehammer blows to your, to your uh, mental understanding of you, you know, value and, and, and life and what, what it means, what, what your motivations should be, things like that. This right here is more of a beautiful story, uh, a mythology even seems like, you know, a beautiful story of how a, the, how the energy of enlightenment pervades through a reality that is ultimately completely diverse and infinite for lack of a better word you know the 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 reality that we're in may not be quote unquote infinite but it's so big and so complex that it, to our human minds it might as well be infinite right so a completely universal and absolute perspective there and you would say well where to go well where to go next you know you have you have it all there, right? There can't be anything more than universal, absolute uh, perspective, right? And the Avatamsaka Sutra, which is translated here as the Flower Ornament Scripture, is something that I might uh, that I like to refer to as transcendental uh, literature, where the setting and what we're doing and and the setting of the of the sutra and what's going on in the sutra is completely transcended any kind of real uh, world application except in allegory and looking at uh, you, you are following archetypes that's it um, and the truths that is is the truth that is expounded on and tried to make plain in something like that flower ornament scripture is um, universal, but it's so rarefied and beyond that it's just, you know, hardly impossible to talk about. You just have to read something like this. But to give an illustration of how that kind of thing is and what it is that I'm talking about, there's, there's many times in Avatamsaka Sutra where, you know, just, just randomly we, we, um, see a dust moat. Okay, um, people might be, we might just be following a setting, uh, you know, framing, 
a talk or something like this that's going on. And then a dust mote is noticed. And after expounding all this stuff um, about the the Buddha realm and how it's encompassing all and all these beings are taking part in this in this setting, we find out that it is within a dust moat. And that other all the dust motes contain this kind of thing. So we get a holographic idea, right? Another way that this book uh, or, or that this scripture accomplishes a fully transcendent um, setting is that something like the first uh, the first sutra, the first talk, the first teaching that the Buddha ever gave is the the spinning of the wheel of of the Dharma. When he became enlightened and then stayed out in solid solitude for a while, contemplating his enlightenment, whether he was going to teach all this kind of stuff. And his first time coming back to, you know, humanity, he goes to uh, the Jetta Grove, I believe, in uh, the Deer Park, and tells these five ascetics. <clears throat> there's five ascetics there that he had practiced with before and he tells them his uh in in his enlightenment he enlightens them and tells them uh his doctrine and this is the first spinning of the wheel of the dharma well that sutra in the pali canon is very mundane it's just what i had just said there right and it's and and they and they talk and they they are monks they are ascetics living in the woods right in the Avatamsaka Sutra, we get that setting of the Buddha coming to give his talk and at the Deer Park. And the setting is completely transformed. And it's uh, showed to you that the, the monks couldn't see this. Their spiritual faculties were not such that they could see all the bodhisattvas around and all the heavenly beings around and all of the you know people from other world systems around. And so, there is a huge expounding of the setting of a happening that we already know before from Buddhist scripture, but reframed to be conterminous with the whole of space, with the whole of the cosmos, and with the whole of reality as it is. One thing that the Buddha does in both the Lotus Sutra and the Avatamsaka Sutra to to as a device for bringing this kind of perspective to bear is he illumines from a, a point in between his eyes light will go out and illumine other world systems illuminate the universe for beings that are in the uh, in the audience in you know in the, in the congregation to see then they can actually see other world systems see other beings practicing buddhism uh, see bodhisattvas practicing see uh, all, all all manner of different world systems and things like that in the lotus sutra it is something that is just awe inspiring and people don't know what to expect in the avatamsaka sutra it is completely uh you know terrifying in a way but also more holographic in the way that the being that is having the experience of this, you know, universal all at once, they see themselves in the other as well. So they see themselves uh, in every world system. So it, it it's more warm and it's more welcoming and and. And that's one of the biggest things about Buddhist scripture that I can say is that a Buddhist perspective, I love it because the world is just as complex and crazy and, you know, it is what it is. It is what we um, experience. But it's, you know, not this, in the West we have this idea of this cold, dead, mechanical, you know, world. And our, our reality is not cold not dead and very much um, evolving and changing and diverse and all this kind of thing. And Buddhism uh, embraces that. When it comes down to it, Buddhism embraces 
the life, the living mind, the consciousness and the warmth of humanity that is infused in the reality that they're in. So I hope y'all enjoyed this. Let me uh, get any comments. Let me know if you want some more. We're going to do some reading. Uh, Jack over at Rambling Raconteur and I are going to be going through the flower ornament scripture here. Chapter 39. Only chapter 39. That is the oh, final chapter, the most climactic chapter of the whole. And it's wonderful. Um, you can get this digitally. Just download it online. So if you want to read along, I highly recommend it. Chapter 39 is one of the most beautiful things that you'll ever read. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing spiritual quest. Definitely not uh, the place to start with Buddhism, though. But if you get the Thomas Cleary translation, it's, def it's very well done. Um, not using a lot of uh, hybrid uh, Pali or uh, Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit or, or, you know, Pali language or anything like that. Everything is translated, even the term bodhisattvas. They are enlighten enlightening beings, beings in the process of enlightening themselves and others. So it's very cool. Just let me know. We'll uh, we'll we'll work it out. I believe that we're going to do Avatamsaka Sutra here in July. I'm gonna read chapter thirty nine. So um, it's coming up. Catch it on the next one, book two. Bye bye.